Good morning, everybody. My name is Michael Crawford. I'm the CEO of the Source ARC. And I'd like to begin today by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land upon which we meet virtually across the country. And I pay my respects to their elders, past and present. Some of you who are regular attendees, regular subscribers to our webinar series will, and those with a keen eye will note that I'm actually uh, in a different room to where I've been for the last uh, three or four months, uh, back in the office, back in the office in Newcastle, uh, broadcasting to you from there today. We have a, a broad audience for this webinar, both uh, direct and those who will be viewing us online uh, via via the recording and so a few words of introduction to the soil crc for those who might not be so familiar with us essentially the crc it's a collaboration a cooperation between research and industry in this case agriculture where we're looking to undertake r d to help farmers ultimately improve their soil management and improve their productivity and profitability in a whole range of different ways. We have 40 particip uh, participants in the CRC, including eight universities, four state government agencies, a number of industry organisations, and importantly, 20 farmer groups or grower groups uh, from across the country. And you actually, uh, you'll hear a bit about that in today's webinar. The, CRC has uh, funding for 10 years. We've just finished the third year of it. So some of our research that we've got in place is now starting to produce uh, results and we're running this webinar series that uh, enables you to be updated and be exposed to the research that we are undertaking. Today we'll be hearing from uh, Vaughan Higgins uh, shortly on the topic of uh, caring for the land, farm care networks and adoptability of soil improvement techniques and practices. Happy to announce today the next couple of webinars in our series for October on, on the 13th of October, so three weeks away. We'll have uh, Dane Lamb from the University of Newcastle speaking on the topic of recovering nutrients from organic waste streams. And on the 27th of October, two, two weeks after that, evaluating soil functional resilience to compaction and drought stresses webinar to be delivered by Dr. Maran Reza Rashti at Griffith University. <laughs> Back to, uh, and, and details of, of each of those uh, webinars can be found on our website and you can uh, uh, register much the same way as what you've registered for this uh, webinar today. <laughs> Back to today's topic, um, Associate Professor Vaughan Higgins, University of Tasmania. Vaughan is an Associate Professor of Sociology in the School of social sciences and his research encompasses the fields of sociology of agriculture and food, environmental sociology, economic sociology and the sociology of science and technology. Very relevant therefore to today's uh, conversation. Uh, Vaughan's worked across a number of agricultural sectors and, and industries and prior to commencing at the University of Tasmania in, in 2018 he was at Charles Sturt University uh, for a eight or nine years before that. A little bit of housekeeping. Today's webinar is being recorded. It will be available on our website in the next couple of days for you to view later or to share with your colleagues. We have, Vaughan will speak for about 20, 25 minutes after which we'll have another 10, 15, 20 minutes for questions and, and answers. To ask questions, type your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, that function is available at the bottom of your screen. There's another box there for our chat, the chat function. Uh, you're welcome to make comments and or read other people's comments in that, but questions, please uh, direct them to the Q&A box so we can uh, manage that process at the end. I'll read them out and, and Vaughan will um, be able to answer them. Uh, I think, yeah, without further ado then, I'll, uh, I'll introduce uh, Vaughan, I'll have introduced him and I'll, I'll pass to Vaughan to, uh, to speak on, on the, the topic uh, which I just read out before. Thank you, Vaughan. Uh, thanks very much, Michael, for that introduction. I'll just um, share my screen and um, we can get started. Yeah, working well. Great. So 
look, I'd like to um, welcome everyone to um, today's webinar. Uh, the topic that I want to talk to you about um, really builds on um, a project um, which we're just over um, halfway on um, at the moment. So the project is um, entitled Understanding Adoptability of Techniques and Practices for Improved Soil Management. Um, today, what I want to do is to provide a brief context on this um, project for those of you who may not be um, familiar with it. Uh, but I also, and I guess more importantly, want to discuss some of the uh, key themes that are emerging from our research. And uh, I'll be using um, the theoretical lens of um, farm care networks, as you can see in the title there, um, to consider some of the implications of those themes um, for adoptability as well as um, future soil research as well. Um, firstly, though, I want to provide a um, short introduction to um, the project team. This is um, very much a, a multidisciplinary team led by uh, led by myself. I have my, my background is in the area of rural sociology, and I've um, <clears throat> had quite a lot of experience in projects looking at issues around farmer adoption. Uh, my my co-researchers, um, Dr. Pete Leith, who um, up until, um, up until a few weeks ago, was employed at University of Tasmania, is now at CSIRO. Um, Professor Melanie Bryant, she brings an um, organisational uh, perspective, uh, organisational behaviour perspective to the uh, project. Um, Associate Prof Professor Catherine Allen um, has, has a back background as an environmental social scientist. Professor um, Jeff Cockfield, um, has expertise around rural governance and economics. And um, last but certainly not least, um, the research fellow, Dr. Penny Cook, who's employed on, on, our, um, on our, our project. I'd also like to acknowledge um, the Farming System Group partners. Um, we do have um, seven of, of these involved in, in our project. They're, they're very much central to uh, the, the, the aims um, and also obviously the outcomes of our project um, as, as well. So Central West Farming Systems, Birchip, Cropping Group, MacKillop Farm Management Group, um, Air Peninsula Agricultural Research Foundation, Foundation Western Australian Low Tillage Farms Association, Riverine Plains, and also NRM North, um, which is located in, in um, Northern um, Tasmania. Some very brief um, background um, about our um, project. Um, basically, our, our, our project is built around the idea that, that based upon previous work, we know that there's generally poor uptake by farmers of new approaches and tools for improved soil management. So significant resources tend to be expended on developing new tools and approaches for soil management that are, that are either rarely taken up by farmers or can be sometimes um, not used as well as what we might like um, by farmers. So this project is, is really aimed at better understanding why that's the case um, from the perspective of those who actually implement and um, are the ultimate users of soil improvement programs, um, techniques and um, practices. And of course, we also want to understand um, how adoption and adoptability um, can, can, can be improved too, because obviously our audiences here are the farming systems groups, but also um, the soil CRC um, researchers, um, both um, undertaking projects at the moment, but also um, future projects as well. So our our project aims, um, just very quickly, we're, we, we're looking at the um, investigating the efficacy of current strategies used by the, those re, by, by regional farming system groups for the promotion and adoption of improved um, soil management. So as I said, our aim is to determine um, from those involved in regional soil extension and implementation, the effectiveness or otherwise of current strategies and techniques um, that are being trialed or, or, or be, being, being used currently across the, our, our seven selected farming regions. 
Um, secondly, we uh, are aiming to develop a framework of commonalities and differences in relation to adoption priorities, drivers and pathways for improved soil management across different um, regional contexts. So we want to really determine and understand how farming groups, um, farmers and, and also farming groups from across those seven selected regions um, uh, integrate understandings of improved soil management. Um, into their planning and practice. And this, I guess, provides insights into um, shared features that encourage um, adoption, but also uh, differences based upon, um, for, for instance, geography, um, soil types, and so forth. And thirdly, um, in partnership with our farming groups, we ultimately want to develop we want to ultimately want to co-develop criteria of adoptability. So also around this principles and recommendations that can actually increase or contribute to increasing adoption of improved soil management practices across those different regional contexts, those different um, farming systems. So really based upon the data that we collect through AIMS 1 and 2, um, AIM 3 is really all around um, refining the criteria for adoptability um, that um, myself, um, Pete Leith, and also Catherine Allen um, drafted as part of an earlier um, scoping study, which was built upon an extensive literature review of the um, adoption, adoption literature. Just a very quick update on some of the uh, our, our project activities. Um, again, just to provide you with a bit of background as, as to what we've been doing and where we're going with this project. Um, so far, year one of the project, um, we analysed soil improvement policy documents, um, programs um, and reports. So um, this, I think, was really important in providing an understanding what soil improvement practices, techniques and technologies farmers should be adopting um, and the possible um, challenges, of course, um, in um, current approaches to, to improving adoption. Um, we completed um, group workshops with around eight to 10 um, landholders from each of the seven uh, regional farming groups involved in, in, in the project. Um, that's, that's, that's now been um, done. That was really aimed at um, developing an understanding of adoptability of improved soil management practices and techniques um, across different farming systems, geographic and also environmental contexts. And, 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 and thirdly, in year one, we completed um, semi-structured individual interviews with four to six um, agronomists, advisors, farming group leaders and representatives of NRM groups in each region. Basically, um, groups of interviewees who we called um, key influencers um, for, for, for within particular um, regions. So, so that's been um, com completed also. And our aim in interviewing these um, individuals was to, I guess, better understand uh, what soil improvement information um, <clears throat> these important um, intermediaries promoted to farmers, how they do so, also the challenges to, to they, that they face. So coming to year two, which is um, this year going to um, uh, next year towards the completion of our project in um, April 2021. Um, uh, so we're in the process of um, analysing uh, findings from our document analysis interviews and our um, workshops and we're, we're also in the process of developing models of adoption drivers um, for improving adoption of an improved soil management um, practices. Um, the final st stage of, of this project will once we've developed these draft models of adoption drivers will then be um, ground truthing those um, refining these through a second uh, round of, of workshops with landholders from the, each of the regional farming systems groups uh, because of um, travel restrictions um, and, and uh, other associated COVID restrictions. Uh, we're still working through um, how exactly we'll organise those. Okay, to, um, to a bit more of the nitty gritty of the project itself um, now. Um, in terms of the analysis of our findings, um, through our um, research, we collected a lot of qualitative social data. So as I said, 
um, seven workshops we um, conducted approximately um, 31, 32 semi-structured interviews with key influencers in, in all of the um, respective um, regions. So what did we actually do to make sense of all this data? So I guess firstly, our, um, our, um, <clears throat> our, our approach was underpinned by what we call a social constructionist approach. Now, this is um, a fairly widely used approach in the social sciences, um, focused on understanding how human and action and interaction constitutes um, reality. So I guess in using this, our, our approach, our interest is not attempt, not, not attempt to generalize findings across a large sample of participants or, or even across specific occupational demographic categories. Instead, I guess the strength of this approach is that it enables us to study differences among regions and participants in terms of their you know, th their own interpretations and constructions of soil improvement. So it enables us to really um, get a quite, quite, quite a rich, detailed understanding of, of how um, those involved and engaged in soil management practices um, understand and make sense of um, soil management. We um, analysed the data through um, uh, through through three main um, steps. So, firstly, um, through open coding. Um, so, developing open codes that focused on um, descriptors. Subsequent to this, we engaged in what's called actual axial coding, so that we could investigate um, the contextual relationships between and also across those codes. And finally, um, these codes form the basis of of, of broader of a broader thematic analysis across the participant codes that we use to investigate the commonalities um, across across our data. In terms of determining which of those themes then were going to be most relevant in, term, in, in, in addressing our project aims, we were guided by the social science literature on adoption and adoptability. I guess the core aim here was to ensure that our interpretation of the um, data was informed by the latest thinking around adoption um, and adoption and, and, and adoptability. And particularly what we were keen to do is to ensure that what we were coming up with it, through our data was actually engaging, but also building in, in a meaningful way on these key debates in the social sciences around adoption and adoptability as well. So the, um, in, in terms of our engagement with the literature, then one of the um, key um, frameworks um, that we uh, made the um, decision to use was what's called um, farm care networks. Now, this has been um, characterized as the webs of interrelations, connections, dependencies that affect the capacity of farmers to be attentive and responsive to the well-being of um, to, to, to the well-being of soils. So, so um, this is a very broad um, definition, obviously, and I'll, I'll, I'll tease this out as um, <clears throat> as I um, start to talk through some of our um, our data. I guess the most significant point to note about the analytical this, this particular analytical framework, though, is it's located within what's called a co-productionist approach to adoption. Now, the, 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 the very much dominant approach to understanding adoption uh, comes from what's called um, the diffusion innova innovations. Um, and this is, in, in many ways, still remains dominant in informing extension um, practice. Now, the diffusion of innovations um, approach uh, assumes that research is conducted by um, researchers and scientific academic institutions. It's the main um, source of innovation in agriculture. What happens is that um, innovations are developed by researchers. Um, the new technologies or techniques that are generated by this knowledge are then assumed to flow in a fairly um, top-down um, or linear fashion from um, researchers to firstly innovative landholders and from there a, a process of diffusion occurs to the broader farming community. 
Now, the diffusion of innovations approach has been fairly widely critiqued for many years now for being too linear, too top down, and also, I guess, most particularly neglecting the tacit knowledge, the skills, the adaptive capacities of landholders, um, all of which are really quite crucial in making innovations um, locally um, workable. So what the co-productionist approach um, does then is it builds quite extensively on this diffusion of innovations approach. And rather than rather than going to the other extreme and focusing only on um, farming knowledge, the co-productionist approach looks at how knowledge is co-produced between scientists, extension personnel um, and landholders. Um, but also the economic institutional and power relations that shape that relationship and which also influence adoptability. So it goes well beyond just simply the farm level or even the local um, farming community level to, to understand all the, the, the range of different factors that influence um, farming practices. So in that sense then, um, that the notion of relative advantage, which is cr quite central to a diffusion of innovations approach needs to be viewed then in the context of multiple influences on adoptability um, at different um, geographical scales. So not only micro, meso, but also macro um, as well. The focus is also on uh, all about creating knowledge that's not just scientific scientifically credible, but it's also socially legitimate and it's practically relevant and in, in, in that it can be made, made to work locally. And finally, there's an emphasis on ongoing learning, monitoring, experimentation and adapting um, interventions. And um, I'm sure you'll see um, shortly some of that coming across through um, the data that we collected. So our, just to uh, move into our findings then, I guess, one, one of the key things that came out through uh, our data from both the workshops and also the semi-structured interviews is that it's pretty clear that the current configuration of farm care networks doesn't really align that well with regional soil challenges and um, priorities. And I've just provided a, a few um, uh, indicative quotes um, just, just to illustrate um, this point. Um, so the first um, from the Central West Farming Systems Workshop, a participant um, uh, said that for the res for researchers, sometimes monitoring our farms might be more useful than just um, a small block. The problem is that researchers are reductionists. They need to be able to control the one thing that they're studying. They can't work in um, systems. Um, the, uh, another um, participant um, said that we'd like to see the research being on some of the topics that worry and concern us. Um, from a purely scientific point of view, you can see things that are interesting in a might, new way they might be, but they're not necessarily going to have a big relevance and a big impact on our farming systems at the moment. So for us, um, th these are obviously just examples of some of the, of the qualitative data um, that we collected, but I think they do illustrate a broader um, point that came out through um, our analysis that in many cases, um, from the perspective of participants, current soil research tends to be too product focused, in some ways quite commercially driven, and also struggles to take account of farming as, as a system and what's actually needed to benefit the farming system as a whole. I guess the question then becomes, how can farm these broader farm care networks be realigned so that um, regional soil challenges and priorities can be taken into account and also importantly that landholders have the capacities to address those challenges and priorities in more um, effective ways. So this brings us I guess to our, our our, our first point about how farming systems groups can play a much more prominent role in terms of um, what we call being trans translators. And we, we, we would argue based on our analysis that um, farming systems groups can be translators in, in, in two key ways. The first is um, through um, what we call uh, a process of softening um, scientific knowledge. So um, this is, um, as I've mentioned on the slide there, <clears throat> translating scientific knowledge is 
knowledge in ways that are locally relevant, that are trustworthy and also practical. The, the, this notion of softening scientific knowledge comes from the recent work of sociologists, um, Solvay Yox and uh, John Law. So it really highlights, I guess, the importance of developing or generating um, practices that enable scientific understandings of farming realities to be um, localized um, and also to be translated in ways that enable soil scientists to better attend to farmers' experiential, observational, and also very, very practical um, knowledge um, practices. I guess in terms of our data, um, a fairly strong theme that emerged was the need for farming systems groups to play a much more prominent role as translators in this process of softening scientific knowledge to make it more workable at a local level. Now this uh, might involve practices such as um, fostering targeted communities of practice, um, partnering with scientific and government um, agencies and the co-development of priorities, um, solutions, and also maintaining local experts who can represent um, local interests scientifically and also vice versa. And I think these two quotes that I've put on this slide um, illustrate um, that, that potential um, quite nicely. And I won't, won't read um, both of those. I, th I think the um, second um, quote in particular is quite a nice one. I think, so this participant says, I think the model is there with the structures. We've got there now that have developed over the last 20 years with the farming groups. It's just about how we use that more effectively. So if you have a stronger network created, strong collaboration created at that farmer group level with those key research institutions, the science will be credible because it's been developed in association with farmers and credible farmers in the area. I think it's really important to point out that a number of um, if not all of the farming systems groups um, that are part of our research are already doing this quite successfully. But many participants also judged that extra resourcing was pretty critical in increasing the effectiveness of this process of knowledge translation. So I guess basically to play a more effective role as translators in the rd &E system, farming system gr systems groups require um, greater resources to do this. And so this is a real, really key point in terms of, um, in, in, in terms of contributing to adoptability. The second point that um, I want to make around farming systems groups as translators um, is in terms of what we've termed hardening local knowledge. Now, this is the second dimension of Yox and Law's framework, which I mentioned before, but this is quite different to softening scientific knowledge. So this is where um, it, we're making farmers uh, experiential, observational and system-based knowledge more explicit, transportable and legible to outsiders. So basically it involves practices for converting farmers um, tacit based and practical knowledge into more explicit forms that can be more easily translatable into scientific worldviews and also <clears throat> practices. And I think again, this is an area where farming systems groups and also broader um, local innovation networks can play a really key role. Um, some examples might include creating safe spaces for trialing and learning. Um, you know, one of the usual practices can be Champion, championing local innovators, um, but also facilitating communities of practice for recording and interpreting um, soil data. And it's the latter of these that really emerged as a key theme in, in, in our research, particularly around increasing local capacity and data management and interpretation, how to get the most benefit um, out of this. So a couple of uh, indicative quotes um, here um, from uh, a participant in ERN in 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 North said, that's the trick technology itself doesn't really do much. It's how you interpret the information. That's the key. And the one participant from Western Australian No Till Farmers Association said, I think one of the things in terms of our teaching and so on is a better understanding of data management. I think. This is a big thing because in our farming practices now there's so much data that's collected by growers. What to do with that data and how to get benefit uh, from it. So I guess the key argument here is um, building these sorts of um, data interpretation and management capacities 
is important in enabling landholders to build a much more quantifiable picture of their farm as a system. And it also provides a way of supporting and justifying decisions that are based on experiential or, or observational knowledge. And in doing so, it enables the farm as a system to be more translatable for a scientific audience. And we think, um, I guess, just as a side note, that the Soil CRC um, could play um, a really key role here in terms of um, project or a project or projects that um, are aimed at working with landholders and farming systems groups to improve this data management and um, interpretation um, capacity is we think this is a really important and, and also under researched vehicle for improving adoptability. Okay, look, just moving on to our final um, final slide then. Um, how then, in, in terms of our analysis so far, what are the implications for um, the development of um, adoption drivers or pathways um, to adoptability? What we've done is to um, develop this framework um, as, as, as a starting point, and it's really, I guess, um, the, the, the main purpose is for us uh, is, is researchers to represent some of the complex relationships um, within broader um, within broader farming um, systems. What we're really trying to do is to identify key adoptability drivers across uh, multiple scales and not just at a farm or, or a local level. Um, our aim here is to also um, look at, I guess, represent and to map out the relationships and pathways between um, these drivers. I guess one of the most significant points to note from this, um, from this diagram is that um, the fr our framework shows that relative advantage, um, which we're defining here as um, cost benefit or marginal gain of an innovation is really just one small part of adoptability and, and a lot of traditional um, adoptability models, relative advantage is front and center, but for us it's certainly an important part, but not the only um, part here. Now, many of us would know that for many innovations, relative advantage is, is pretty straightforward because the cost versus benefit is, is fairly clear cut. However, where the cost benefit of an innovation is less clear or more complex, a range of considerations need to be taken into account. Um, that can differ, of course, depending on the nature of the soil challenge or um, priority or institutional drivers and constraints. So um, this is really our starting point for developing pathways to adoptability um, that we will take to back to the farming um, systems um, groups. We developed these drivers of adoptability based upon an extensive um, literature review. Um, I guess, um, the way in which we've positioned them on, 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 the, on this diagram um, is based largely on the analysis of our, of our data um, so far. You'll note too on, on the right hand side of the framework there, we've positioned farming systems groups um, and broader innovation networks as central um, in translating those drivers at different scales and also play, of course playing a central role as I mentioned before in terms of hardening local knowledge and um, softening um, scientific knowledge in order to um, to generate much more effective alignment of that farm care uh, network. The next steps for us then will be to, I guess, develop adoptability pathways from this framework, which, which we're in the process of doing at the moment. Uh, we're ground truthing these pathways using um, our research data. We're then going to take those pathways back to consult with the farming systems groups in, in further refining and obviously giving our, 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 our partner groups the opportunity to provide their input into what's most likely um, to be workable um, for them. So that brings me to the um, end of the presentation. Um, thanks very much um, for, your, um, for your attention um, and I'll certainly um, welcome any questions. Thank you very much, Vaughan. And so that's good you stopped sharing your screen. Um, so the opportunity is there for people to ask questions via the, the Q&A. We, we have a, uh, a question lined up from Aravind, but boss people are typing in questions. And before we go to Aravind's questions, um, 
if I can just make a couple of comments as, as CEO, that um, the type of research that, that Vaughan and his team are, are doing is very important to informing and influencing how the CRC does business. As I said in my introduction, we have 20 grower groups, farmer groups, farming systems groups in, involved in the CRC. And the involvement of those groups was integral to this CRC bid being successful, being funded by the uh, Commonwealth Government uh, back in 2017. And so <clears throat> it's really been our aspiration to give life to that involvement, to ensure that there is a good engagement and the right sort of engagement between the grower groups and, and the researchers. So for those researchers who are online, especially from the soil CRC, especially the, the biophysical researchers, uh, it's this sort of uh, information that Vaughan presented that's behind my, my request, my, my demands of, of you that you do engage with the grower groups in, in designing, developing, implementing, interpreting the research at all steps. And to the grower groups representatives and, and members who are, who are there, you know, <coughs> this is why we've got the source house so, and the opportunity is there for you to, to get engaged and, and to, um, to work with the researchers to ensure that the research is relevant, that they are <laughs> the scientific um, knowledge is softened and conversely that the, uh, the great work that's been done by, by yourselves and by your, your farmer group, farmer members, that local knowledge is, is hardened if you like. And so there's the opportunities. So let's go to, to some of the questions, uh, Vaughan, if you can uh, read them there. First, uh, we've got Arabin, and this uh, came up early in your presentation where um, you made reference to soil improvement policy documents. So Arabin just wants some elaboration, not sure what you meant by soil improvement policy documents. Are uh, these soil CRC policy documents on soil improvement? No, but not the, the, the broader, I think. So, so Vaughan, to you. Yeah, uh, thanks, Aravind. Thanks very much for your, your question. It's, it's a fair question. Um, so um, basically the soil improvement policy documents we're looking at um, are much broader than just um, soil CRC. So we're, we were looking um, at um, soil, um, it was really quite broad. So looking at anything that related soil health, soil stewardship, soil improvement at a national um, scale within Australia. Um, and then, um, we also looked at any relevant documents and reports that existed. Um, these could be government, these could be industry-based at a um, state level as well. Um, we, we did just confine our search at a state level though to those um, states where um, we, were, um, we were conducting workshops with farming systems groups. So it wasn't, um, wasn't all states and territories in Australia, but I, I still believe it was reasonably um, comprehensive and that was actually really valuable as I said in the presentation in terms of contextualizing provide, providing that really useful background context to the sorts of um, practices that um, farmers are expected to be adopting and also um, highlighting um, some of the challenges as well. Thank you Vaughan. I'll, I'll go to the next question which is from uh, Susu Wynn in uh, Myanmar, so representing our international interests, international audience here, and and um, and I'd suggest that many of the, the many of the, um, the findings you have is, is just as relevant uh, internationally as it is um, in Australia. So Myanmar asks, uh, or she says, we agree on frequent monitoring in the farmers' fields. We do need to ask the questions or survey the farmers' history of the plots in Myanmar. Farmers usually do not have soil analysis data in hand not only weather data, cropping pattern, their practices, standard crop situation, what we've seen on the farm, but also soil and water sample collecting to answer the nutrient uptake problem in the field. I would like to know, do we need soil analysis data at the time of problem finding, or we have to see the long-term practices on the farm? Thanks. Mm. Yeah, thanks, thanks for that um, question. I, I, I guess my response to that is, we, we, we do need to have that longer term understanding of um, farmers' soil management 
practices um, because at the end of the day, their practices are very much informed by longer term observation, experiential knowledge. And, and look, um, that um, is very important in terms of imp informing their soil management um, practices. Um, and I guess the point, one of the points I was making in the presentation is that those sorts of, that, that sort of knowledge, those sorts of practices aren't always necessarily neatly captured um, in, uh, in, 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 in soil data. So we need to find ways to better um, reflect that, those knowledge and practices in the ways that we um, collect soil information. Thank you, Vaughan. A question from Richard Doyle. To me, it seems from this work that it is the taking of the research to and working with the early adopters in the key pharma group discussions, then add the peer-to-peer -peer learning activities to take it wider. Is that correct? Um, thanks, thanks, Richard. Um, my answer to that is, I guess, yes and no. Certainly that's part of what I referred to when I was talking about the softening of scientific knowledge. But I think we do need to be very careful with this approach of assuming that we just simply transfer this knowledge from scientists to early adopters and then assume that it will be diffused to a wider audience. This is where farming systems groups become very important in terms of um, working with some of these um, adopters and early in, in, in innovators. And I guess innovators may be doing th things that uh, are not even well aligned with what soil scientists are doing. So they, they might be going out on limbs. So in some cases, it's their work that also needs to be fostered and um, supported um, as well. But yeah, look, certainly that peer to peer, those peer to peer learning activities are pretty critical. Um, as, as part of, part of broader um, learning processes. Thanks, Vaughan. And that little discussion reminds me, and the points you made reminded me of some advice given to me um, as a younger scientist, agronomist or science, which I'll not pass, I'll take with you passing on. That the best scientists in this area are those that are, that are half a step behind the best farmers, looking over their shoulder, looking at what those innovations are, and then trying to understand them from a science perspective, take them broader, et cetera not three steps ahead of the farmers such that the work is totally irrelevant to what's going on, not three steps behind the farmers such that you're irrelevant because you're doing yesterday's uh, research. But yeah, yeah, to the younger scientists out there, connect with those leading innovative scientists, understand what they're doing and, and try to put the science in behind it, take it further. That's where the opportunities are. Learn from them. Uh, Christine White asks, there are regions in Australia where grower groups are not functioning and, and indeed the soil CRC doesn't have such a strong relationship. How can the soil CRC activities and projects engage growers and livestock producers in these regions? So I may, maybe you ever go to first born and I might pick up if you want to. Thanks, Christine. I, I think that's a really pertinent question. Um, look, it's obviously not something that we covered in our research, but um, I think um, just because farming systems groups may not exist, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that there won't be discussion groups or local innovation networks that we can't um, tap into. I guess the key question though is finding uh, for, for us as researchers um, or, or, or other people interested in, in soil improvement, it's a matter of finding our way in, in a way that's credible and has um, legitimacy as, as well. So um, obviously working closely with um, respected um, individuals and groups that um, are all, already may have priorities and um, are, are addressing issues within those regions. Thanks Vaughan and I guess I'll, I'll add to, to um to stating that the Wallace CRC has a long time frame of 10 years and um, collectively we have um, an amount of cash and in-kind resources. Uh, there's still a challenge in actually undertaking that, that engagement um, across all parts of Australia, all, all sectors or, or enterprises or industries. In fact, it's, it's, it's something we're not set up to do. Um, but our, our opportunity, our challenge in, then is to work with existing networks um, to link in, hook into those existing networks that um, ultimately do, that farmers in turn do access and help to uh, yeah, put the information out there 
um, in, in various ways such that it can, can be picked up and, and um, disseminated and, and engaged. Yes, it's a bit back to that sort of linear approach of, uh, of the um, extension model that, uh, that Vaughan spoke of. Um, but the reality is that, yeah, we just do not, we're not set up to, and we don't have the resource to, to engage in that hand-to-hand that -hand partnership with grower groups right across Australia. But um, looking for opportunities uh, to, to expand it into wherever, wherever we can. Go okay, Richard again. Um, the other thing which seemed to come through was the data overload and tech, technology gadget overload without the learning at the farmer learning and discussion level. As this is where the level of usefulness, the best application, the real value can be added or shown to, to other farmers. This is correct. So I think he's referring to you. Yeah, we're seeing a lot, lot of activity in the um, ag tech, soil tech type space, a lot of gadgetry, a lot of um, people of U-Boot solutions being pushed out there. Farmers have, have this overload now of, in the ag tech space. Not all of it, not all of it is uh, useful, usable or used. Can you comment very uh, Yes. Look, I think I, 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 easy answer, Richard. Uh, uh, Yes, it is correct. Um, I think, um, I, I mean, I wouldn't want to dismiss out of hand that um, we shouldn't um, be developing um, new products or, or, or technologies, but I think that needs to be seen as complementary to the equally important task of ensuring that um, that farms and also farming systems groups are equipped with, with the capabilities for data interpretation and management because you know as you rightly pointed out there is a lot of data that's already being being collected it's what to what to do with it that's really the key um, key question and if more resources were devoted to that that may then um, that may then um, <clears throat> address issues that mean that particular um, products may not may not need to be developed. So, so we, 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 we need that more, more research done on that, I think. All right, thanks Vaughan. Listen, I'm, I'm, the questions have, have dried up, which is, which is totally fine because our time is up as well. It's a, a quarter to the hour. I'd like to, uh, to finish here by thanking Vaughan very much for the presentation, for the, uh, the webinar on behalf of um, himself and his project team and all the, when I say the project team, not just the academics, but the broader, um, Broader um, suite of contributors uh, through the grower groups to, to that to that research, which in turn is helping to inform the approach of source hours he takes into the future. Just uh, again, looking at our next couple of uh, webinars, to a quick advertisement: Dane Lamb from University of Newcastle on the 13th of October, looking at recovering nutrients from organic waste streams, and uh, Maran Rezo Rasti from Griffith University, looking at um, <laughs> evaluating soil functional responses to, uh, to drought stresses. So go to our website, register for um, those webinars if you have an interest. If not, um, or in addition to that, just broadly look at our website, follow us on Twitter, connect with us on LinkedIn, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and um, stay up to date with, uh, with what the source house is doing in a range of ways. So thank you everybody for your time. I wish you well. Uh, for